Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to this Royal College of Psychiatrists webinar showcasing the winning entries to our COVID-19 essay competition. This essay competition was the idea of one of our honorary fellows who was keen to mark the unique contribution that UK psychiatrists have made over the last 12 months to the global COVID-19 pandemic and the prize was made possible thanks to their generous donation. Our honorary fellows are a diverse group of people and an honorary fellowship is the greatest honour that the college can bestow. Our honorary fellows are drawn from amongst eminent psychiatrists, scientists and connected academic disciplines and those who've given distinguished service to the study, prevention or treatment of mental illness as well as those who've rendered notable service to the college or the association. So I'm absolutely delighted that three of our honorary fellows, Stephen Fry, Alistair Campbell and Naveen Evans, all agreed to help with the very difficult task of judging the competition and to help virtually present the prizes this afternoon, along with our president, Adrian James. The topic for the essay was how the COVID pandemic has taught me to be a better doctor and psychiatrist. And it was open to core and higher trainees in psychiatry, specialty doctors and associate specialists within five years of training, as well as newly appointed consultants within their first 12 months of being on the specialist register. A prize of 250 pounds uh, was made available to uh, a doctor in each category uh, for the best essay, as well as the opportunity to present their essay this afternoon at the prize winners webinar. We asked each applicant to specify what they would spend uh, the prize money on uh, should they uh, win. We were absolutely overwhelmed with high quality entries and I feel very privileged indeed to have read every single one of them. So many moving accounts of how the pandemic has impacted on each and every one of you in every aspect of your professional and personal lives. I'm very proud to be a psychiatrist, uh, very proud of you all and of the work you day, do day in and day out. So now, without further ado, I'll hand over to Adrian James to say a few words and introduce our first winner. Well, thanks very much, Kate, for that uh, introduction. I I'm really delighted to be joining this webinar, focusing on the learning and development opportunities arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, the pandemic has had a devastating effect in terms of loss, in terms of morbidity and changes to every area of our lives. But there's also been uh, some learning and some positive aspects. I'd really like to thank our donor for having the vision to identify the need to use the pandemic as a learning opportunity and to donate a prize that has produced such an amazing response. And I want to thank our judges and all those who have won prizes and everybody who has entered and say thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's really been very moving to, to read the, uh, the entries. So I just want to read a message from our donor who wishes to remain um, anonymous. So all doctors are an, am an amalgam of clinical and non-clinical skills cemented together by knowledge and experience. The COVID pandemic, while producing great challenges, has also given the opportunity to enhance all these skills. I feel it very important for everyone, but especially trainees, to reflect on this. It would be too easy to permit the pandemic clinical experience to slip into memory, whereas lessons uh, learned should remain with everyone forever. Reading all the essays demonstrates themes which should not be lost and require to be taken forward clinically and non-clinically for the benefit of our patients. It has been a very humbling and yet an exciting experience to read the essays and I'm delighted by the response. Best wishes for the future to all those who wrote and also to the prize winners. Remember, our patients rely on us. So thank you to our anonymous uh, donor for that uh, message. So I'm really pleased to introduce our first prize winner. 
in the trainee category. Alex Kermy uh, has uh, won the, the trainee uh, prize and he's written a powerful essay full of learning, growth and self-reflection. So over to you, Alex, and thank you so much. I found it very uh, moving uh, to, to read your essay. So, so thank you so much. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. James. Uh, thank you to the college uh, and esteemed colleagues. I want to dedicate this essay to my grandfather who taught me how to read. How the COVID pandemic has taught me to be a better psychiatrist. The past year has been turbulent like no other in most people's memory. Strangely, with this turbulence has come much solitude. While far from being amongst the worst affected by the COVID pandemic, I have faced my fair share of difficulties. I've been separated from loved ones, worked with patients in desperate situations, and have had to confront some of the darker aspects of my nature, which are normally masked by the frenzy of the everyday. Behind such challenges, I believe, lurks the opportunity for growth. As a psychiatrist, I feel I am in the business of growth, that by the different means at my disposal, I try to facilitate an environment for my patients such that their lives move in a better direction. This could involve the alleviation of negative experiences like lessening anxiety or lifting depression, but could also take the form of positive achievement, getting a job, uh, reconnecting with one's spouse. In my experience, there is much to learn from my patients. Similarly, there is much I have learned from my own collisions with life, which I have found helpful in the clinic. For me, the past year has been a confrontation with stress, fear, self-doubt, loneliness, and the unforgiving. Through these obstacles, however, I've learned much. What truly adds value to my life? What is the difference between pain and suffering? What does it mean to be self-compassionate? What is the difference between intelligence and wisdom? I don't have final answers to these questions, but I have begun to learn lessons which I have found immensely helpful to get through difficult times with great ease. The most sublime part of this process, however, is to have the opportunity to share my experiences with my patients and my colleagues and to discover what the joy that can be. So here are four ideas that I'm gonna present in briefly today. Number one, there are times to control and there are times to relieve. Modern life is a lot about control and predictability and convenience. As technological innovation has transformed our lives, so have our unconscious attitudes to what, towards what should be. This tendency is what has allowed human beings to become the dominant species on the planet. We have become so successful at establishing control of our lives that when the, pan the pandemic began in the beginning of 2020, most of us, including me, reacted to it as though it were a nuisance, like substandard customer service. As the harsher reality of the situation emerged over subsequent months, we despaired at how powerless we had really become over major aspects of our lives such as whether we could leave the house, who we could see, where we could go. Yet I've found there's an alternative to, not, to merely not being in control, and that is to be in a state of release. And that is a state of accepting reality for how it is, rather than for how one wishes it to be. The dichotomy of control and release, of course, is reflected in our nervous system, which has a sympathetic component for attack, retreat, and generally getting things done as well as a parasympathetic component for rest, digestion, and recharging. Increasingly, I find myself in situations where I'm in control, but going nowhere. And I've become more adept at knowing when to release. For me, release looks like turning off the news, doing regular meditation, appreciating a sunset, and savoring what's in front of me. The value of release, and this is key, is to know that there are a sense of calm, that can be found in each moment, even when you don't get what you want. Number two, pain and suffering are not the same thing. Not being able to see loved ones and to have certain freedoms taken away, to treat patient after patient in crisis are all painful experiences. More often than not, pain quickly bleeds into suffering and we tend to experience the two as one tangle of negative experience. In dialectical behavior therapy, which I've been fortunate to gain some exposure to, patients are taught to make this distinction between pain and suffering. And in doing so, one realizes that while pain is inevitable, suffering is often optional. Not only is pain ine inevitable, it is actually useful 
pain is a signal from reality that something is not right. We would not want to live a life without pain. But if we can examine our mental reactions to pain, we can begin to live a life with remarkably less suffering. If pain is a difficult on call shift, suffering is the self-critical internal monologue that follows. For me, this can sound like, you did a terrible job in that situation. You should have known that was gonna happen. You should think about changing careers. Suffering is the unhelpful mental process which occurs in reaction to a painful experience. It demands impossible standards and it sets us up for failure. It views every failure as a final verdict on your value. Time has allowed me to make this distinction between pain and suffering more proactively. And in the space created by a reduction in suffering, I have room, found room for something more helpful, which is compassion. Number three, compassion is something you can give to yourself. Loneliness is not merely being by oneself, but it's actually a deeper pain resulting from being alone and feeling in some way insufficient as a result. We respond to loneliness by seeking the company of others in the hope that they can provide us what we can't provide for ourselves. Of course, if they can't, then we feel, we can even feel lonely in the presence of other people. But what is being with others is no longer an option. It feels strange to try and find something from within that we normally get from others. But this becomes less strange when we realize on close inspection that we really do exist in relationship to ourselves. We know this because after all, we have to talk to, negotiate and discipline ourselves. We have inner conflicts and at the best of times, we find it difficult to get all of our various oars rowing in the same direction. Once one accepts that one is in a relationship with themselves, then the question becomes, what kind of relationship do you want to have? As the months of lockdown wore on, I realized through reflection and personal psychotherapy that the relationship I had with myself was good in many ways, but was significantly lacking in self-compassion. By this, I mean, I did not actively accept myself as I happened to be in any given moment. I realized unconsciously I was seeking this compassion in others. And that meant that when I was isolated from others, the isolation was that much more stark and painful. For me, self-compassion has been a key piece in the puzzle and learning how to be alone, but not lonely. Number four. Do not confuse intelligence with wisdom. Intelligence and wisdom are easily conflated and the difference between the two often emerges as one moves through difficult situations in life. We live in a time, arguably, where we are surrounded by intelligence in the form of technology, access to knowledge, debate, and yet there seems to be a dearth of wisdom and perspective. Many works of popular fiction illustrate this point through the wise idiot archetype. The character who does not possess what we think of as intelligence, yet who has a grasp on something more intangible about the nature of things that some supposedly more intelligent people do not have. Although intelligence is obviously useful, it can be used to deceive oneself and others, to rationalize poor decisions and to justify destructive behavior. The difficulties and tensions of the pandemic have forced me to confront the difference between the two in my own mind. When faced with something I do not like, I am talented at producing intelligent workarounds. This can sound like, I am an exception to the rules because, or the transmission rates outside have not yet been ad adequately examined and other similar rationalizations. I have learned that intelligence must be nested within wisdom. Wisdom is more about appreciating the big picture and having the courage to wrestle with reality as it is rather than trying to manipulate reality to suit whatever your goal happens to be. Sometimes wisdom is more about inaction than action. Under the right circumstances, but not always, wisdom can be staying at home. To conclude, coronavirus has subtracted a lot from our lives, including comforts that normally insulate us from some of the more fundamental and tragic aspects of life. Solitude has forced me to come to terms with myself and I've become a student of my emotions, especially the negative ones. And I've made friends with fear, shame, laziness. Some of what I have learned has helped me to see my patients more clearly and to know that often the only difference between doctor and patient is mere circumstance. My hope is that with greater self-acceptance, I can better accept my patients as they are. 
that I can help them navigate the difference between pain and suffering in their own lives, motivate them to have compassion for themselves when they can't find it in others, and to move in the direction of wisdom in trying times. This is, of course, a lifelong process, but if nothing else, I'm grateful for the self-examination the pandemic has catalyzed in me, and for it to help me to help others has been the greatest privilege. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, uh, Alex. And now we're gonna move on uh, to a message from our honorary fellow, Stephen uh, Fry. Stephen, English actor, comedian, uh, writer, and huge friend of mental health. So Stephen will say a few words to introduce our next winner of our core trainee category, Tom Walker. Over to Stephen. Hello, I'm Stephen Fry, and I've just had the great pleasure of reading nine wonderful essays <clears throat> by a range of psychiatrists for this Royal College of Psychiatrists competition, which I've very touched to have been asked to help judge. I'm an honorary member or fellow of the college, but uh, I don't let that go to my head. Um, listen, it's been a remarkable experience reading these essays. I think they all show the extraordinary commitment, passion, and intelligent self-awareness of uh, psychiatrists working around the United Kingdom today. Um, some of you are young, some of you are more experienced, some of you are still trainees, some of you are consultants, and so on. And um, one of the things I noticed as a theme, if you like, was um, how important the famous biopsychosocial model is. In other words, how incredibly important it was for you to try and fit in those three elements to the patients you were seeing. It was just not enough um, to be the cliche psychiatrist who pushes pills and doesn't even ask basic questions about lifestyle and um, income and family and all these other issues of course it's you know this very well but you also know the outside world has a strange view of psychiatrists as being somehow heartless and absurd and you know pharmaceutically be obsessed but one of the things that's so clear from this is just how committed you are to the welfare of your patients how angry you are about the inequalities particularly that this pandemic has uh, has highlighted um, and how determined you are to continue in your work to do as much for your patients as you can and how much you have learned about yourselves uh, as well as your practice. So I just want to thank you all. Um, I'm, I'm not going to single out the winner. You'll see uh, who, who, who has uh, come to the top of the pile in my estimation, but I want you to believe that I loved every essay and was really taken by the personalities and commitments behind them. That's enough from me. Thank you very much indeed, and good luck, and keep at it. Oh, goodness, I see that I have actually been asked to announce the winner. Well, my favourite essay was CEP 038. I know nothing about <clears throat> this psychiatrist. Um, I do know they practice in northeast London, because that's there in the text of the essay. But it was a, a marvellously measured and yet also passionate piece. Um, that absolutely summed up so many of the different issues that all of the essay writers were interested in. And that is the, uh, the three sides of the biopsychosocial model, as we talked about in my earlier introduction, and um, also on learning from patients and learning from colleagues and committing to the nature of psychiatry during the pandemic and looking towards the future as well. It was just a marvellously balanced and superbly readable and intelligent and wise and insightful piece of writing. But they all were, so I don't want you to feel that just because I've chosen this particular psychiatrist that I had nothing but contempt for your pieces because, believe me, I was impressed by everything. There we go. Great. So thank you to uh, Stephen for that lovely introduction to uh, winning essay CP038. Uh, we've known everybody as numbers until uh, very recently. So CP038, Tom Walker, over to you. 
Hello, everyone. Um, and thanks to Kate for naming me there. And of course, Stephen's very flattering introduction. Um, and congratulations to all of the other winners. So my essay starts. In psychiatry, we place emphasis on the widespread use of George Engel's biopsychosocial model. In his original paper, Engel wrote of the prevailing attitude in psychiatry at the time, but sought a return to the neat and tidy biomedical model of other medical specialities, driven by technological advance and the elucidation of the mechanisms of disease. In calling for a rejection of the primacy of the medical model, Engel contended that it was all medical specialities that were in crisis and implored all doctors to think of all health as inseparable from the social factors in our lives and our psychology. The COVID-19 crisis has necessitated a reassessment of how we practice psychiatry and provided us with opportunity for growth and development as doctors. Whilst our fundamental biology and our medicines remain unchanged, COVID-19 has caused a great deal of change to our social factors and environment. To prevent rising COVID-19 transmission, our patients and the wider society have been required to stay at home, practice social distancing measures and wear face masks in public. These social changes have more greatly affected those in more deprived socioeconomic groups who, for example, have had to shield or self-isolate in more confined spaces are less likely to have financial reserves to utilize and are more likely to have suffered job or educational loss. In short, the pandemic has highlighted the importance of social relations and treatments for our patients and laid bare the devastating effects of economic inequality on health outcomes. <clears throat> the need to socially distance provided the impetus for a rapid shift towards video consultations, a standard practice in psychiatry. It is doubtful that this shift would have occurred at the rate it has without COVID-19. While the longevity of this shift remains to be determined, it appears certain that some forms of video consultation are here to stay. In my practice as a core trainee, during the past two rotations, there have been a number of situations where video consultations have augmented practice, providing new channels of communication into previously inaccessible places. On my acute psychiatric ward in East London, we were able to set up a meeting in which three family members in Birmingham, London and Amsterdam communicated with their brother and son in a ward round. After establishing this was viable, we were able to suggest video consultations to other disparately located relatives. I've also been able to start my short psychotherapy case training over Zoom with a patient who, COVID-19 aside, is struggling to make or attend any appointments due to anxiety. In summary, video consultations provide benefits in, for example, situations where there is a significant geographical distance between patient and psychiatrist, where staffing levels are light, and for certain forms of communication where purer forms of verbal communication are key. In the summer, I rotated from the acute wards to working with older adults in liaison psychiatry. On the wards in acute hospitals, infection control measures require consultations to be conducted wearing surgical masks, aprons, gloves, and often visors. Communication with frail older adults on noisy wards has always been challenging and requires resourcefulness. Sensory impairments are common, and the value of checking for working glasses and hearing aids locating the good ear and sitting on that side and having a glass of water on hand for a raw throat are tried and tested techniques for enabling otherwise complicated communication. Masks and visors designed with prevention of infection transmission in mind have had the side effects of preventing the transmission of friendly smiles and impeding sounds, leaving older adults more isolated than ever. Certain actions have provided ways around impediments to communication that COVID-19 has generated. For example, with patients who have good vision but struggle with hearing, spending a bit more time using whiteboards and pads to write down messages has proven useful. Friends and relatives remain, for the most part, unable to visit their loved ones on the wards. Older adults are less likely to possess a phone whilst an inpatient in hospital. The telephone and tablet resources on acute wards are technically unpredictable, adding to the already established obstacles of delirium and acute confusion. 
This has brought significance to the collateral history, which doubles as a means to send messages to hard to reach patients and to provide guidance on where and when to drop off essential items. In the future, increasing use of video calls would be one answer to relatives' inability to visit. Alongside COVID-19 infections, we saw a social pandemic relating to the effects of economic and social inequality on the health income outcomes of different groups. The effects of social inequality on our health have been known for some time. In the 1970s, the epidemiologist and public health doctor, Sir Michael Marmot, investigated cardiovascular disease experienced by civil servants in Whitehall. He found that cardiovascular mortality and morbidity rates decreased in a stepwise gradient with increasing grade of civil servant. The effects on life expectancy and disability life three years remained when the groups were controlled for all the usual risk factors such as hypertension, smoking and family history of heart disease. Marmot had found that socioeconomic status itself was a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. In psychiatry, a large sector of our patients are lower socioeconomic status. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the disparities in living standards and challenges faced by this group. Patients living in smaller spaces with higher density of people and less material resources to draw upon have been worse off under the conditions of the lockdown. In 2010, the UK government commissioned the Fairer Society Healthy Lives Report by Marmot. Marmot's report proposed a framework for action to close the gap in health outcomes linked to inequality with six policy objectives that sought to maximise individual and community potential through health, social justice and sustainability. The report called for investment in evidence-based measures designed to tackle inequality and therefore prevent disease and bring about long-term benefit on disease burden, including mental health. The release of Marmot's report coincided with the second anniversary of the 2008 crisis and the government's subsequent focus on austerity lessened any real hopes of the investment required to action these policy objectives. What we have seen from early on in the COVID-19 pandemic are the results of this lack of investment. COVID-19 has been shown to cause more deaths in areas with more deprivation and has also discriminated against certain ethnic groups more than others. In a Channel 4 documentary, Is Covis Racist? Dr. Ronks, an a &E doctor in East London, highlighted that two thirds of all healthcare workers who died were from a BAME background and spoke to the friends and families of those who tragically passed away. Dr. Ronks captures their feelings of turning up to work. Am I going to die? Am I going to get unwell? Am I going to work? Although this sentiment was by no means exclusive to BAME frontline staff, there was certainly good reason for BAME staff to feel her words more acutely. At my workplace in North East London, we have a diverse workforce, typical of the population we serve. We have had many discussions about the virus, the vaccine, and how the pandemic has affected our friends and families. COVID-19 has made me more aware than ever about the importance of listening to and respecting the views of my colleagues. The events have provided an impetus to air and share our understanding of the events going on. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought about the most profound changes to our lives in recent times. The radical need for change in the way I practice has enabled me to improve as a doctor in how I communicate with my patients by the bedside, in facilitating remote communication and sharpening my awareness of the social factors that influence and often restrict my patients' lives. As a recent editorial in the British Journal of Psychiatry bulletin by Peter Byrne and Adrian James implored, placing poverty inequality at the, century of, at the center of psychiatry is a worthy goal for all of those working in psychiatry. Thanks for listening. Great, thank you, Tom. Uh, and now I'd like to uh, introduce Alistair Campbell, author, journalist, broadcaster, honorary fellow of the Royal College of uh, Psychiatrists and mental health uh, campaigner. Uh, and Alistair is going to say a few words uh, and introduce the winner of our uh, um, SAS uh, category uh, winner, uh, Dr. Pooja uh, Kupili. 
over to Alistair. Well, hello there, Alistair Campbell here, and I was very pleased to be one of the judges for this prize. And I'm very, very pleased to uh, be saying something about the winner of the SAS, Who Dares Wins prize uh, category, and that is CEP012, otherwise known as Dr. Puja Kupili. So why did I particularly like this essay? First of all, I think it really answered the question, how has the pandemic made me a better doctor? I think it went into that in some detail, and I really like the mindset behind that. Uh, I love the quote from Einstein, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. And if you look over my left shoulder, there, just above my European flag, you probably noticed that in British public life, you have to have a flag behind you now, and there is mine. Uh, but just above that, you'll see a poster for a, a book, my book on depression, living better. And I have, uh, I'm not claiming to be Einstein, by the way. He has in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. And I have get good out of bad. And what Dr. Kapuli's essay said to me was that there is good to be got from the bad of COVID. And it was a very, very clear exposition as to how that has happened for one doctor, how she has reacted, how she has developed. And I was particularly struck by her direct experience as having started the pandemic in India and then in the UK and uh, maybe more in common than sometimes we might like to think as we look down on the rest of the world in our very British way. So I hope that gives you some feel for why I was particularly taken by her essay and why I'm very, very pleased to uh, add my congratulations for her win. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alistair. So over to uh, Dr. Pooja Kupili, the floor is yours. Hi, Pooja, are you able to switch your camera on? Well, huge apologies uh, for that technical uh, glitch. We seem to have uh, lost uh, Pooja temporarily. So I think in the interest of time, if it's okay, I'll start to read her essay. So how COVID pandemic has taught me to be a better doctor and psychiatrist. The year 2019 was quite perturbing with the coronavirus, claiming many dear and near ones at an individual level and destroying the economy and healthcare systems globally. Apart from the direct effects of the COVID, associated lockdown and social distancing have been reported to take a toll on mental health. Rather than adopting a black and white perspective of the situation, I believe that it's prudent to reflect on the experiences which the pandemic taught us. As a psychiatrist who had moved to the United Kingdom from India 
in the middle of the pandemic, I had an opportunity to interact with patients across various phases of the pandemic in both nations. As a result of the pandemic, I must admit that my skills as a doctor and a psychiatrist have improved. I believe my interactions with the patients suffering from COVID have improved my ability to listen and empathize further. The mental agony they described was unfathomable. The uncertainty about their outcome, accessibility to patient care in the background of long hours of waiting time for the emergency services and full occupancy in the hospitals was unsettling. I'm sure that I'll be able to empathize with patients in anxiety even better because of the profound influence of those conversations with COVID survivors on me. I consider myself becoming more resilient in managing patients in these difficult times with a scarcity of resources, with fewer face-to-face -face appointments of mental health professionals and the limited physical support of the family. Many of the patients had hit a panic button. It was initially quite overwhelming for me to handle it with a toddler in terrible twos at home. And then I reflected on my experiences and improved my resilience by adopting mindfulness, a healthy lifestyle and effective problem solving techniques. So I believe that the pandemic has helped me grow as a person. And I think this improves the quality of care I impart to the patients. I reckon that the pandemic has improved the way I interact with patients. I've utilized every consultation as an opportunity to alleviate patients' anxiety clear myths about COVID and the need to maintain a healthy lifestyle, which is necessary for physical and mental health. I also reiterated the need to follow the COVID safety precautions during the interaction. And this holistic approach in pandemic times has made me a better doctor rather than a psychiatrist who has a keyhole vision focusing only on mental health. One of the other things that the pandemic has taught me was utilizing technology to improve patient care. Due to the lockdown and limited access to the outpatient clinics, I was initially concerned with the relapse of psychiatric illness in patients and the emergence of new illnesses. However, with the help of virtual team meetings and online consultations, I'm happy that I could effectively handle this problem with coordination and support from my team. The silver lining was the patient feedback that they felt reassured with a sense of connectivity. The majority of patients reported that they would prefer virtual consultations in the future as they save time and money for the commute to the clinic, highlighting the environmental benefits with a reduction of our carbon footprint. I believe that to become a good psychiatrist, one must be passionate about learning and research. And during the pandemic, I was able to participate in several international webinars as well as conferences. If it wasn't for COVID, I would not have attended in person as they were associated with travel and high registration fees. And by participating in these events, I listened to some great lectures, networked with several psychiatrists globally, expanding my knowledge and learned about recent advances. Furthermore, I'm happy to have made a small contribution to the mammoth body of research on mental health and COVID-19 by publishing the literature on the potential role of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors in COVID. As Albert Einstein said, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. My experiences during the pandemic stands as testimonial to this statement. It's made me a better doctor, improving my clinical and technological skills and expanding my academic horizons. Though the pandemic is showing no signs of waning currently, I now feel more confident that I can adapt to this tumultuous situation by utilizing available resources with ease. In case I win the prize, I plan to contribute to the trust where I'm currently employed and work closely with them to develop a program to promote positive mental health during the pandemic. So thanks to Pooja, and I'm sorry that you didn't hear her wonderful essay in her own words. And I hope that we'll be able to record Pooja uh, and include her uh, reading her own essay at some stage on the website. Um, so now I'd like to uh, hand over to um, our next uh, honorary fellow who needs absolutely uh, no introduction. 
Navina Evans, child and adolescent psychiatrist who's worked tirelessly throughout her career to influence and improve the quality of patient care, which has culminated in her rising through the ranks of management uh, levels to becoming uh, Chief Executive of East London Foundation Trust, a post that she uh, held until the autumn of last year with, when much to all of our delight uh, involved in the world of education, she became Chief Executive of Health Education England. So over to Navina, who is going to uh, introduce our final prize winner, Navina. Thank you so much, um, Kate, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this um, wonderful experience, actually, to, to read um, so many of the um, entries and then uh, to be a judge. Um, I was really moved to read all of the um, entries. In fact, I re read and reread them. They were um, one word I think I can use to describe them all. They were beautiful um, and really hard to pick the ones um, I, I found most um, worthy, but I think all were tremendously worthy, but always you have to pick the one. So I'm really thrilled um, to introduce this new consultant um, winner's essay. And the things that, that really struck a chord for me was the humility, um, the humanity, and the personal account of vulnerability that um, was really uh, succinct and what so beautifully described in this essay by someone who'd just become appointed a consultant. Uh, I remember when I was first appointed a consultant, you're full of sort of anxiety and hope and you know that's, that so much depends on you and you need to be clever and strong and all of those things. Um, but there was a real uh, wonderful connection with, um, with what the impact of the pandemic um, on shaping um, this new consultant's life uh, currently and way into the future, I'm sure, uh, making him an amazing leader going forward. It's a truly authentic piece um, with filled with humility and hope. So I'm really proud now to hand you over to Dr. Saifula, uh, Saifula uh, Bangash uh, to read his essay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Evans, for your incredibly kind words. Um, and thank you, everyone, for making it to the fourth and final installment of uh, the pandemic essays this afternoon. So um, without further ado, how the COVID pandemic has taught me to be a better doctor, stroke psychiatrist. Write hard and clear about what hurts. Ernest Hemingway. It is hard to believe that we are slowly but surely coming full circle. This time last year, we were waking up to the intangible and surely unassailable rumblings in the world outside our collective selves. This year, we find ourselves subsisting alongside a spectre that continually seeks its pound of flesh. I am joined by many friends and colleagues who have and continue to devote their professional lives to being part of the most profound lived experience that our profession has ever faced. This has been achieved at great personal cost, loss of life and time away from our loved ones that we can never get back. One touch of nature makes the whole world kin. William Shakespeare. There is hope in a collective suffering that continues to test our capacity and endurance. Holmes and Rahi's enduring inventory of the 1960s reminds us of the stresses we endure. From the mundane to the devastating, there is comfort in a framework that gives voice to often overwhelming and hard to articulate experiences. There is no question that the stress associated with life and living has existed pre-COVID. In mental health settings, it is well acknowledged in those seeking our support. It is equally prevalent in professional lives, enabling us to find common ground in our attempts to alleviate the afflicted. From navigating a series of setbacks, we seem to have transitioned to a concerted crisis, striving to find a way forward in mutual suffering. 
As you grow older, you will discover that you have two hands, one for helping yourself, the other for helping others. Maya Angelou. As a passive participant in the School of Life, I am constantly reminded that the past cannot provide anything meaningful in the absence of reflection. The role of significant others in nudging me towards this uncertain present stands out on a well-worn mantle of memories. My life began in the NHS to a young homemaker and a junior doctor in training. Their message of finding gratitude in small yet life-enhancing situations and making a purposeful contribution is a lesson that is hard to ignore. I continue to benefit from their shared wisdom whilst attempting to find my own purpose. I have been fortunate in other relationships as well, both personal and professional, serving as beacons of solace along the way. If life began as an island, remote and aloof, it is now a thriving archipelago enriched by its members. The topography of life is continually disrupted, caught in the seismic torrents of change. Jolted repeatedly after each period of complacency, I now grudgingly concede that all life experiences play a crucial role in regularly examining our place in the present. We are thus propelled to repurpose ourselves for future survival. This most perilous pandemic has laid out in stark relief more frailties than I have ever cared to acknowledge. This time last year, I found myself at a crossroads in my career. The training wheels were gradually coming off and future consultanthood appeared less abstract. As the storm clouds gathered on the horizon, I mentally grafted more steels to my spine in watchful anticipation with others. The professional pandemic would have to wait though, for I had unknowingly begun my descent into perdition with an unwelcome assailant as my guide. There soon followed days and weeks of isolation as I took leave of formerly unappreciated roles and freedoms. There is no greater relief than finding oneself still afloat after the passage of a virulent storm. Restitution soon followed, although I was far from restored. I had stumbled out of a savage netherworld, unaware of the pernicious transformation that had taken place within. A well-tested idiom wisely counsels getting back on the horse following an existential crisis. What if the horse so diminished in flesh and spirit that it yearns to be put out of its misery? Thankfully, hope was rekindled by the helping hands of those I had prepared to lead. A strange new realization dawned that any perceived shortcomings could be easily mitigated by a support system of friends and colleagues. In their quest to endure as a team, it was impossible to lag behind. Sustenance also came unexpectedly from those we serve with overwhelming compassion in navigating shared goals. I reluctantly thanked the menace for robbing me of my paltry pre-COVID self so that I could be enriched by the contribution of others. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and freedom. Victor E. Frankel. The old and familiar must make way for the reformed. As the oppressive summer drew to a close, I quietly shed the nomadic life of a trainee emerging as a chastened pandemic era consultant psychiatrist. I was weary after a long and arduous climb, but it has never been a solitary journey. It is shared by all those who have and continue to negotiate this with me. My training has prepared me to nurture the only skill set a humble psychiatrist has at its disposal to listen perceive and be present. In the competing seesaw of work and life, I shall endeavor to be mindful of moments when I'm less able to keep up. I have a team to keep me in check. Friends, family, colleagues, patients, carers, countless others 
and an organization that is wise to be inclusive of us all. It is early days yet, and I am still finding my voice. The inner one grows stronger, the outer one still affected by a personal pandemic. There are many changes to reconcile in ourselves and the world around us. A harsh reality has made us evaluate our old and unimaginative ways, replacing this with more thoughtful and efficient means to engage ourselves and the world. We are present and keeping safe, whilst social separation is being overcome by yet more novel ways to keep in touch. Relationships and contacts are no longer taken for granted, bringing us together like never before. In our professional world, engaging ourselves and our communities has always been a challenge. There is renewed commitment and purpose to our engagement. We must have the courage to listen, reflect and adapt when this is asked of us. The pandemic has struck our culturally diverse communities the hardest, divesting us of many multi-generational contributors to this proud collective of island nations. It is heartening to witness oft circumscribed and marginalized others find their own voice and purpose in these hard times, reaching out to provide relief beyond their communities. Alongside a deadly isolating scourge, hope also spreads in tandem, bringing us together in unprecedented spirit. There is much inspiration to be drawn from our diverse communities and diverse colleagues. As I embark on a career in perinatal mental health, maintaining the integrity of families and future generations has never felt more compelling. I am proud to be part of a professional team that is open to learning from the lived experience of those who attend our services, often remaining as valued collaborators. We continue to learn and grow together while engaging our communities. Listening to our diverse communities has enhanced our efforts in engaging them and those involved in their care. Their voices and experiences are represented in our contact with a range of professionals across health and social care, ensuring befitting access to healthcare and opportunities. As we repurpose our services in the pandemic era, the trust and confidence of those we serve must also be nurtured. Therapeutic conversations must continue beyond working hours and the workplace, ensuring our communities and their support systems remain in touch. Purposeful engagement from our service continues via digital platforms, the media, and in community settings. We are mindful that the basic needs of our communities must be met if we hope to succeed. Our efforts have been enhanced by working alongside and contributing to voluntary and community organizations. Our family is growing as we serve our communities in shared fraternity and partnership. I am certain that I'm not alone in my experience of finding it hard to reflect on the many changes this past year, particularly whilst the present remains so uncertain. As the devastation continues, there is a bewildering realization that it took a pandemic to remind us of our resilience and capacity to evolve. I am keen to devote both personal and professional resources in listening to our communities whilst finding shared engagement and purpose. I am continually reminded by my friends, colleagues, and the communities we serve that there is much in the way of personal capital that is immeasurable and inextinguishable. There is still so much left to give. In a perpetuating cycle of love, loss, and life, we must endure, assuredly, never alone. I thank you all. Great. Thank you, Safe, for that very moving account. And I love the way that you drew on uh, the fact that we're all interconnected human beings in this and a real sense of community. I've certainly felt a real sense of uh, community 
with you all today and on our um, uh, audience uh, via the, the webinar. And there have been some lovely uh, messages coming through on the, on the chat function. And uh, I guess these webinars have been a good demonstration of us all keeping in touch with each other um, despite being uh, uh, remote uh, and isolated throughout all of this. We've only got a few minutes um, left and I'm just wanted to, is, is Pooja with us? I'm just trying to see, she was back, um, but I don't think we've got her. Oh. No. We have Pooja. Uh, hi, I, can you hear me? Wonderful, we can hear you Pooja, and that's absolutely fantastic. I'm so sorry that you missed out on the opportunity to read your essay. I, I did my best, but it wasn't just the same as you reading it. So I'm hoping we can maybe film you uh, reading it and, 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 and put that on the website um, uh, uh, at some time in, in the future. But your essay was, was wonderful. I just wanted to start off with, with, with you because you, you made that wonderful quote um, about the holistic approach that you'd taken to people's uh, healthcare in the pandemic. And that had made you a better doctor rather than a psychiatrist who has a keyhole vision focusing only on mental health. And I just want, wondered if you wanted to, to say a few words about, you know, what you hope that you're going to take forward as a, as a, a, a doctor and psychiatrist from this pandemic. Because it sounds like there are things that, you know, we don't want to leave behind. We want to carry with us as a profession. And that was a, a, a point that you particularly focused on the being a doctor rather than just a psychiatrist. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. K. Firstly, my apologies for the technical glitch and uh, you have read out my essay really well. Uh, well, the pandemic has taught me a lot of points which I can definitely use to improve my skills as a doctor first and then a psychiatrist next. So uh, the pandemic has taught me that it's really important to inquire about the physical health, to uh, take, uh, to, to consider mental health and physical health together rather than, you know, uh, taking a piecemeal approach at health. We should be seeing health as a to complete one concept rather than dividing it into physical health and mental health. And of course, the other thing which stayed with me during the pandemic is, uh, we like i think i've become more resilient you know by whatever you uh, resource i have i'm confident enough that i can handle any situation with ease and uh, of course i've learned a lot regarding the technology and i'm sure i'll be using the technology a bit in my uh, future consultations as well and uh, i hope it will be more cost effective and it will be easy and accessible to the patients so that's my learning points from the pandemic fantastic thank you and, and and several of you mentioned so Alex and and and, and Tom and um, Safe as well about the importance of having space to uh, to reflect and and you know very very moving accounts of you know getting to know yourselves really really well in the pandemic and I just wondered Navina um, whether you wanted to come in and say anything about those as sort of you know leadership. Uh, you know that that is a requisite for, for you know leadership competencies look i'm i'm i could burst can i just say that first of all it's just wonderful i'm so proud and, and i was just listening to you all i don't do any clinical work anymore i'm coming to the end of my career you're at the very start of yours um i'm just so proud to be part of a profession that is producing clinicians like yourselves. It's just truly wonderful. Please do not lose that authenticity and that connection to people. Um, that is what will be so, so important. Your humility, your vulnerability and your authenticity. That's all I can say. Don't lose that because you've all got it in spades. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. Fantastic. And I think that's the really good point to finish. So just huge thanks to everybody that's taken part this afternoon, to our uh, judges, to our anonymous donor, to our uh, award uh, winning uh, essayists, uh, to everybody that was brave enough to uh, put themselves out there and, 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 and contribute and, and write and uh, you know, absolutely fantastic efforts. It's been hugely moving. Uh, and thank you to our audience who have contributed 
uh, greatly as well through the, the chat. So without uh, any further ado, I think I'll call it a wrap at that. Thank you very much, everyone. Stay safe and stay well.